I would encourage you to turn to the book of Proverbs, the 18th chapter of Proverbs. You may recall that we just finished chapters 1 through 9 of Proverbs, which forms the introduction to the whole book, consisting of longer poems and nine or ten appeals from the wise sage or father to his son or his children, uh, encouraging them, exhorting them to walk the path of wisdom and godliness. That was all in preparation for the actual proverbial statements that then begin in chapter 10 and run through the rest of the book. And so for the next few weeks, I would like to consider just a handful of themes that we see run through uh, chapter 10 and following the actual Proverbs. Let me begin, though, with uh, this question. What do you think is the strongest, the most powerful muscle in your body? Some of us might be thinking that maybe it's the jaw muscle. I've read that uh, it, it contains a force as strong as 70 pounds per square inch. Others might be thinking uh, it's the heart pumping all that blood through the body, keeping us alive. Uh, maybe it's the leg muscles, the quadricep muscles, those largest of muscles in our body. Well, well, let me alter the question just slightly. What muscle has the greatest influence, the greatest effect in life? I'll give you a hint. It's a small muscle, about yay big, tucked away inside your mouth. It's the tongue. To be sure, it is the tongue. I mentioned just a couple weeks ago that a person on average makes about 70 to 75 different decisions every day. Well, one body of research reported that the average American speaks about 800 words each day. The research seems to fluctuate quite a bit. Some suggest it's a few thousand. But take 800, even cut 800 in half, 400. Cut that in half again, 200. There's really nothing that we do more regularly than to speak and use words and hear words that are spoken to us. And arguably, there's nothing that has a greater effect on our lives and the lives of those around us than words. Words. And Proverbs 18, verse 21, really contains the principle behind this truth. So it's just one verse. Proverbs 18, 21. This is what it says. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. If you had never heard this verse before, if you had never received instruction about this verse, and before the service, I simply asked by way of survey, where is the power of life and death? I suspect, I think I would be inclined myself to say, oh, the power of life and death is in, is in the Lord. Or, or the power of life and death is in the evil one, as Paul calls him, the prince of the power of the air at work and the sons of, of disobedience. Life and death, that power is in the Lord or the evil one. Well, there's truth there, of course, but that's not what the text says here. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Think about how influential the tongue is. Almost every Bible-believing church would recognize the, the weightiness, the seriousness of God's commandments. Take the Ten Commandments. Take the Seventh Commandment. You shall not commit adultery. The Eighth Commandment. You shall not steal. Those are serious, significant, weighty commandments. Yet I have never seen, and I bet none of us have ever heard of a congregation being led into any great division, any great meltdown because of adultery or theft. But the sin of gossip or slander, words that cut, those are easily overlooked and dismissed, but they can spread like wildfire, destroying whole groups of people, dividing. 
all because of unbridled tongues, unguarded mouths. Think about it. How many people lose their jobs all because of their mouth? Anger, frustration surfaces. They lose control. They unleash foolish words at those around them, perhaps their superior. How many marriages have suffered or even been destroyed because of the tongue? How many friendships or relationships among family members or within the body of Christ have suffered or even ended? Because I felt inclined to, to state or post my personal opinion on a matter, that was more important to me than preserving the relationship. Most of the counseling that people receive from counselors, therapists, psychologists, is not the result of physical abuse. Certainly, it occurs. It is the result of emotional wounds that people are carrying around as a result of words, words that degrade, belittle, cut. I'm confident that most, if not all of us, know this already, but throughout the scripture, there are numerous, numerous themes that run throughout it but that some themes are amplified more than others. Some themes in scripture receive a greater emphasis than other themes. And the importance and the use and the effect of words is certainly one of those amplified themes. I remember a, a doctoral class at Reform Presbyterian Seminary in Pittsburgh at the beginning of the week-long class on preaching and communication uh, the professor said, sometime through this week, I want you as an assignment to read through the whole book of Proverbs, all 31 chapters, and I want you to highlight or underline every single verse that you think is giving particular weight upon the use and the effect of words. I'd never been given such an assignment before. I thought maybe there'll be a dozen or two verses. You should have seen how highlighted and underlined that book was. It's in every chapter. It's throughout the entire book. But it's not just the book of Proverbs. It's through the whole course of God's word. Think about it. How was heaven and earth made? God spoke. He spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light. And there was light. So the world came into existence through the use of words. And it's not just creation. It's also redemption or the application of redemption. That is the result of the spoken word. Paul argues that in Romans chapter 10 when he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, but how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe without a preacher? And so he says, so faith comes by hearing and that through the word of Christ, through the word of the gospel. Creation is the result of spoken words. The application of redemption is the result of spoken words. And I've wondered, why would God give so much emphasis upon the use of words? Perhaps because our ability to form words and our ability to speak words is part of what makes us God-like. It's part of what it means to be image bearers of God. As far as I know, people are the only creatures on the earth that have the ability to form and to speak words. Parrots may mimic a person, but they don't really grasp what is being said. Like God, we can use words to form relationships with people, to build community, to impart hope and life through the use of words. Notice in the text the directional nature of words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. It doesn't say communication is in the power of the tongue or education and instruction is in the power of the tongue. That's true. But here the tongue or words are not in this position of neutrality. They're moving in the direction that is either life-giving or life-taking. So this principle, this truth, is a bit like a law. We might call it a law of life. Like other laws, if we want to call them 
a law, the law of gravity or the laws of motion and physics, like those laws, they can be used for you or against you. They can be used as a blessing or a curse. Right now, the law of gravity uh, is working for all of us, it seems to me. It's working well. We're sitting, in my case, I'm standing, all is well. But if one of us were to climb up, I'm not sure how you would do it, and I discourage anyone from considering it, one of these poles here all the way up and were to jump off, now the same law of gravity that was working for you is now going to be working against you. Right? The law of motion can work the same way. It works for us. But if you get in your vehicle and speed up to 100 miles an hour and lose control, that same law of motion is going to be working against you. And the wise father here is saying to his son, your words are not neutral. They can create life or they can create death. And that's true not only in our individual lives, in our relationship with our spouse, with our children, in the life of a whole congregation. There is power in our words. And that's the amazing thing. Where does this power to produce life or death reside? Life, that of flourishing, that of hope, that of encouragement. It's in you. It's in me. What has greater value than life and death? Yet the power to produce it re resides within us. And that might make us a little bit uncomfortable that we possess something of this kind of weight and force in our lives. And we might also think, uh, those with power are people in high positions. Those are the people who have power and influence. Rulers and magistrates, they have power. Or people with affluence and wealth, they have power and influence. Or people who are educated, they have power. But in fact, the power of life and death are within you. Which is why three chapters later, in chapter 21 of Proverbs, in verse 23, it says, Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. The psalmist prays something similar in Psalm 141. O Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. When he says, and the, and the proverb says, keep, whoever keeps his mouth, it's speaking about guarding, putting a guard over our mouth and over our lips. And I think it's so wise to recognize the uniqueness of this principle here in Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Because this is a principle that is uniquely Christian. It is unique to us in the kingdom of God. Think about this. Arguably, in the broader culture in which we live, one of, if not the highest principles related to the use of words is the principle found in the First Amendment, which contains, among other things, the freedom of speech. And that's a right and a blessing that many of us cherish and want to protect. Yet you and I are called to a higher principle than that. Which is crucial for the flourishing of the people of God. We are not only called or given a freedom, a right to speech. We are called to speech and words that produce life. So that the purpose of words is not only to be able to express what I believe or think but rather to impart life to other people. That's a higher principle that we are called to. So Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Or think about Paul's words in Philippians 2. How difficult are these? Do all things without grumbling 
or disputing. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. So this speech is not first about the promotion of one's personal views or perspectives. It is about considering others. It's a call to self-denial. Knowing when to speak, when not to speak, how to speak. I took just a couple hours this past week because I was considering this text. Just a couple hours examining as I was speaking or as I was listening. And, and just taking that amount of time to examine, why am I talking here? What, what's, what's, what's in my heart? What's motivating me here? And it was exhausting. <laughs> and it requires that kind of work to, to consider what, what is moving me to speak the way I'm speaking in this given circumstance. If it was so natural to speak words that build up and encourage and give life and heal and glorify God that offer hope, we wouldn't hear so many exhortations and warnings throughout the scripture about the use of our words. But in fact, what we say, what we don't say, is actually a reflection of something deeper happening in our hearts. Sinclair Ferguson said, every word we speak is a revelation of our heart. Every word we speak is a revelation of our heart. Here's how Jesus put it, both in Matthew 12 and Matthew 15. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Again, in Matthew 15, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And he lists evil thoughts false witness, slander. So the war over words, whether what we speak is going to produce life or death, is not fought with a greater vocabulary or greater eloquence. The war over our words is fought on the battleground of the heart. And the proverbial wisdom here of Proverbs 18.21 gets at this when it says in the second line, of the text. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. That is, what you love is what will consume your heart and flow out of your lips. What you love is what you will talk about. The challenge is that there is a war within our heart between loving that which is godly and loving that which is wicked. Every Christian knows that warfare that happens inside. And one of the manifestations is our words. Arguably one of the most important chapters, it seems to me, in all of scripture on the use and effect of our words is James chapter 3. And among the things that James says in the first part of that chapter is that our tongue is like a spark or a small fire which can set on fire a whole forest. He actually says we can almost, in a sense, unleash a kind of hell through our words. He goes on and he says this, James 3, 7. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. How is it that the, 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 that the same tongue can produce blessing and life and cursing and death? And yet that is what we experience in our lives. It seems to me our lives, including our hearts and our tongues, are like a garden or a flower bed. And not only are plants and fruits 
growing and bearing life, producing words, we might say, of encouragement and strength, hope and help and love and unity. But in that garden and in our hearts, there are also weeds that are growing up. Weeds that may produce words that are divisive, that discourage, that gossip. Now, we're at a time of the year where much is growing up. There's a lot of green all around. And if you're like me and you look around your house, gardens around the periphery of your house, and you see weeds coming up, unwanted shrubs, what do you do? If you're me, you just go get the weed whacker, which we need to do, actually. Right? And you just whack them down. But you know when you're using the weed whacker, this is a temporary kind of fix. They're going to be right back the next week. There's a root system beneath the surface that no weed whacker is going to solve. And that's often how sin and unsanctified areas of life are addressed. So that the same pattern of cutting words or words of discouragement or words of discord come out and they come back again and again. Because there's a deeper system taking place in the heart, in what we desire, what we're after. And yet through all of this, as convicting, as challenging as it is, there is good news. The, the gospel shines forth because we're not alone in this cultivating, gardening work in our lives. Our God is a good gardener and he's rolled up his sleeves and he's not only seeking to uproot those areas that are unsanctified, but he is seeking to plant ever planting new seed, the seed of his word, deep in our hearts. Listen to these words from uh, Ruth Simmons in her book, Beholding and Becoming. She writes, if you've mismanaged your heart tending and in turn your tongue taming, take heart. It's not too late. Jesus welcomes the regretful tongue that willingly comes to him. Our God is in the business of heart transformation and he begins a new day and he begins a new day by day with those who are willing. Be willing, friend. Stay the course. Let your redeemed heart redeem your speech. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Lord, let our hearts overflow with you. For those of us who are in Christ, our Lord Jesus is the word made flesh. He is the message of God. And he dwells within us. He has not only redeemed us, but he abides in us and is seeking to use us as vessels that speak words of life, of hope, of encouragement. What tremendous opportunity the people of God have. Having this power to speak forth words of the gospel, words of life, words that encourage those around us. And so Simmons says this, the hallmark of a mature Christian is that he or she knows how to speak when it is costly knows to remain silent when there's freedom to speak and to discern what is best for the glory of God. Let's pray together. And Father, we thank you for your word to us and that you speak into our hearts, uh, sanctifying us, convicting us, continuing to grow us. We pray, Lord, that we might do that work not only at this moment, but today, this week, of examining our heart's desires and motivations. Lord, we pray that you would use this most important vessel and part of our body, the tongue, words, our ears to hear, that they would be used to impart life. That we would consider others before ourselves that we would have that attitude of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Use us in this way, Lord, that you would build us and strengthen us as your people. Lord, may we rest upon your word, how you have spoken to us words of of truth, of salvation, and of the gospel. For this we are grateful. We pray this in Jesus' name.